Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. You know, I left the room a while ago. I felt like I was walking down that aisle behind the priest, and he was reading out that little book, and I was going to leave me in that room and flip the switch. It's the way I feel every time I do one of these things. What's up, Grand Isle? You know, I, there's a lot of things that I want to say tonight, and I'm going to forget half of them. I'm going to get in the truck on the way back to the house. I'm going to say, Gene, you know, I forgot to. And uh, I've heard about this conference for years. But I thought this was the wrong one. I figured I was going to show up down here in this little aisle and there'd be 65 or 70 of y'all. Gene said, oh no. Because Gene's just over there from, from, uh, Crystal Beach. He said, there's going to be a lot of people there. I said, oh great. But it's an honor and it's so overused. Honor and a privilege to be asked to do anything. And when I get done with this little fairy tale I'm going to share with you tonight, you'll understand that. Miss Pat, I hope and pray to God Miss Pat gets a copy of these CDs from this weekend. Thank you, Miss Pat, for keeping that light on in, a, in an absolute desert of futility. For so many of us that, that need to find a way. I never met her, but I met her this weekend. I met her through George, and I met her through Charlie, and I met her through Miss Jeannie. I met her through Keith. She'll live from now on. And guys, it's a big deal. I called my little girlfriend back in Atlanta. I said, you know, there ain't an A&A meeting on that whole island. She says, how is there so many people there? I said, they're crazy. (laughs) They just drive from hundreds of miles. But these things don't just happen. Um, They take great pride and a lack of organization here. But it comes together. I mean, they really do. I'm not being funny. I was talking to, to George earlier. Y'all, y'all meet twice a year. Y'all will meet right after this, and y'all meet again to figure out how y'all going to do it next year. But if you ask the left hand what the right one's doing, they ain't got no idea. But it comes together, 502 of you. And my friend Diana and, and, her, and her buddy Chris rode their motorcycles over from Lake Charles. They're the two. Uh, Diana has hosted me uh, and, and some friends over at her facility, New Beginnings, uh, a, a few times, and she's a true sister. My name is Larry Scott, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm free tonight. When I tell you I'm free, I don't wake up in the morning and wrestle with that demon no more. God took that away of many a year ago. The thing I wrestle with is me. And I'm going to tell you a little joke. Uh, somebody in this room had heard an old talk I gave years ago, and they said, you going to tell that monkey joke? I said, I wasn't. Oh, man, you got to. That's the reason I'm here. <laughs> so, probably your fault, Brett. One day this old monkey was sitting up in a tree smoking a big old fat joint. And a little old lizard waddled up underneath that tree, and he said, Hey, monkey, could I have a hit on that joint? And the monkey said, Sure, dude. So he hands it down, and the, and the lizard hits it. He says, Whoa, that's some really good stuff, man. Whew, I got cotton mouth. So he waddles down to the river and sticks his head down in there. He's lapping up water. And this great big crocodile comes lumbering up there, and he says, Hey, lizard. Who's got the pot? And he said, the monkey back in the tree, man. He said, okay. So he stomps through the jungle. He gets to the bottom of the tree and he looks up at that monkey and says, hey, monkey, can I have a hit on that joint? And the monkey looked down and he says, damn, dude, how much water did you drink?
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a man that is the greatest man I've ever known. I'm going to let down my shield for just a second. This man's name is Charlie Yao. And I don't just say that because it sounds flowery. If I could be one-tenth of the man that that man left on this planet, the legacy, my life would be fulfilled. I've never met a man that was so humble in my entire life. And the legacy he left behind is it's never too late to start being nice to people. Charlie Al was my best friend. Charlie Al sat in the chair where Gene Russell now sits. And we carried this message all over the planet through the Joe and Charlie style book studies. We rode them old iron motorcycles all over the place. We'd go to California, Arizona, we'd rent them, go up to Canada, and we had a ball together. September the 29th, 2012, Charlie Yao gave his last talk. Charlie Yao sat next to me for the final time, and I didn't know that was going to happen. January the 23rd of 2013. Charlie went up to, to make coffee at that big meeting. And when you get there, I can tell you what he's going to say to you. Charlie Yow is going to sidle up to you and he's going to offer you a cup of coffee. Because, see, he has already self-appointed himself to be the DCM of heaven. He is. He's the designated coffee maker. And he's going to walk up to you and he's going to stick out that big old hand and he's going to say, My name's Charlie Yow. It's really good to see you. And he'll mean it. Oh, Charlie boy. I miss him every day of my life. Now into the story. Y'all came for the story. When I got here, all I wanted to do was not drink liquor and hurt no more of God's kids and, and just maybe not die. Because I've been skirting that, that sentence for a long time. I just didn't want to die and I didn't want to hurt nobody else. And what I discovered some years after being here, some guys told me that if I did what was outlined in our book, that our founders left, I could get what they had, but I had to do what they did. And there's a guidebook here. It tells me when to read, it tells me when to pray, it tells me when to write, it tells me when to go out of the house, it tells me when to talk to another, it tells me exactly what I need to do. Me and George were talking on the gangway out here a while ago, and there's an old timer, my grand sponsor, named Doc Crandall, he's a legacy in Atlanta, Georgia, been gone since 1987. And I asked Doc Crandall one day, I said, Doc, what do I do when I quit, when I get done working these steps? He said, boy, you lay real damn still because you're dead. So that gave me all I needed to know and because there wasn't a yeah but to that. So if I want what they had, i got to do what they did. Ebby Thatcher's bad to drink liquor and make a, make a mockery out of this white-collar industrialist family that he was from. He became a, a sore spot to that family. And they said, Ebby, you need to go away. You need to go away from Albany and going up to Vermont and hang out. And after a couple of times of going to jail, they were going to lock him up for alcoholic insanity. And a couple of guys showed up in court and asked the judge to suspend his sentence. They said, we got an experiment we'd like to try on him. He had a spiritual experience and was rendered sober and was doing well serving serving uh, soup up at that Calvary Mission in New York City. And they said, Ebby, you're doing good, but you can't keep this unless you give it away. He said, to who? They said, you know some drunks? He said, I do. He called up his old buddy Bill. Our book tells us that Ebby had two months. He showed up and he made a 12-step call on his friend Bill Wilson. Sixty days. Bill Wilson, as we well know, had five and a half months, and he went over and saw Dr. Smith. Have you all heard a year yet? A year to do anything? It's not in this book. 
Thank God they didn't wait till they had a year. I may not be here. You may not be here. And if you follow the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, you'll find that every one of the first 100 took no more than 30 days to do the, to do the work. All the work. So it's the day before Mother's Day, May the 12th of 1935, and Bill Wilson walked into that gatehouse of the Cyberling Mansion in Akron, Ohio. Because he was about to drink some liquor. He had already reasoned he could drink at least three. No more. Well, we know that Bill Wilson ain't never had three of nothing. And he knew the only thing that was going to keep him sober was working with another alcoholic. And they, through a turn of events, he gets in touch with this Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob Smith. Dr. Bob walked into the room and Bill looked at him and says, man, you look like hell. Dr. Smith, you look like you could use a drink. Dr. Bob's shaking, been puking. About that time he got happy. He thought Bill was going to reach in his, in his vest pocket and pull out a half pint. You know what Bill did? He didn't ask him about his drinking. He says, you know, Bob, he says, I've looked just like you look right now. I felt exactly the way you feel right now. I thought exactly the way you thought. I drank like you drank, and I got into the same jams that you got in, and I lost it all. But I found a solution. What started out to be a 15-minute conversation, we already know, lasted for five and a half hours. Dr. Bob would later write in his memoirs that, that he had never met anybody that knew more about the drinking game than, than Bill Wilson. Bob's got a couple of weeks, and they went over and they, to, the, to the hospital, and they did a 12-step call on a guy named Bill Dotson. Sixth hospitalization in six months. Eighth hospitalization, I'm sorry, in six months. He sobered and never drank again. See, ain't none of these guys got a year. But their fellowship is telling our people that you got to have a year before you can put anything there you want. It's not part of our program. And I got some haters in here, and that's okay. I'm good with it. I do it all over the world. But if your book tells you anything about a year time frame, I'd love to see it. If them boys had waited a year, we wouldn't be here today. They got it while it was hot. They stopped the bleeding, and they got these guys in the middle of this deal, and, and here we are. So it's December the 31st, 1987. God intervened in my life. I'd like to tell you I had my last drink, but I didn't. I didn't drink no more after that night, but God intervened. And he intervened in a way which our book calls indeed miraculous. Miraculous means an event that happened that can't be explained. It just did. They use the word phenomena in our book. Same thing, you can't explain it. When I introduced myself tonight, I said that my name was Larry Scott and I'm an alcoholic and I'm free tonight. I'm free. I'm as free as you've ever seen in your life. And I ain't never known that before. I've been a slave to anything that felt good to get me out of right here, right now. But I ain't that way no more. I'm a little boy about six years old and I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. But family was down there in that southeast quadrant of, of Georgia, and I was, they, they all lived in a little town called Hazelhurst. It was a farming community, and all my people were farmers. And one night, a, an older cousin walked up to me, and he had a ball jar of that, that moonshine liquor. And he says, you want a hit of that? And I said, as a matter of fact, I do. Six years old. I took a pull on that thing, man, and it burned all the way down to my toenails. And I said, "Woo, boy, I'll never do that again. That's the most hard-tasting stuff I ever put in my mouth. Little did I know I'm going to chase that demon for the rest of my drinking days. Because, see, I didn't drink no more liquor after that. But a couple of summers later, they sent me back to Hazelhurst. This has got to go. They sent me back down to Hazelhurst to work in the tobacco fields. And I was too little to get down there and actually crop the tobacco. So my job was to drive them tractors. And you motorcycle guys in here, y'all going to hook up with this. They had a farm all, they had a John Deere, and they had a Ford. 
And at lunchtime, while the farmhands was in the house eating, it was my job to gas up them tractors. They had a big old thousand gallon pump out there underneath the pecan tree and it had a handle on it like this. It didn't have an automatic cutoff. So what I would do is I'd lay up on the hood of that tractor and I'd pump and I'd listen for that gas to come up in that field neck. What I discovered about that time is I love gasoline. I love the way it smells and I love what it does to me. And I had three tractors to fill up in a row. They'd come out and find me all passed out underneath that pecan tree grinning. Well, at the end of the summer, I'm a pretty quick study. There's an Amoco station two blocks down the street. I went and got me a job. And there was no automatic cutoffs on them pumps back then. Them old Cadillacs and those mobiles would come in there and you pull that tag down. I'd get down there and I'd listen for that gas to come up in the field neck. They'd find me passed out grinning with gas spewing everywhere out in the driveway. I love gas. When we were pulling in here uh, Wednesday, Charlie said, this is a gas community. I said, rock on. <laughs> I'm home. I've come to the gas mecca. So I'm a couple of years older, and somebody come along one day and said, uh, You know, if you get that model airplane glue and squeeze it in a penny candy sack and breathe it in, you can get a little buzz. I said, hot dog, I'm in. So we went and stole a couple of tubes of that down at the grocery store, and we squirted some of it in a penny candy sack and started huffing it. There's 14 of us in an alleyway before school one morning. I can't tell you much about it. I don't know if y'all ever huff glue, but it gets you out of right here right now. And... uh I was laid up on the hood of this woman's car in this alleyway, grinning and laughing and cutting up. Well, the police came, and they locked us all up. To this day, they ain't got a charge for what they locked us up for. They just knew we were having way too much fun. And they put us on a little old probationary thing. And my daddy, he didn't understand the glue sniffing thing, but he blistered my tail for stealing the glue. Because I came from a good moral family, see? Ten-cent tube of glue. Well, fast forward a little bit. I got a buddy named Danny. Danny's still a really good friend of mine. He ain't one of us. But we decided we'd like to take a drink every now and then. We'd get these guys down there at the Jack's Liquor Store to buy. We'd hide in the hedges and give them a few extra bucks, and they'd go get us a little bit. And I'd, I'd drink whatever they'd buy me. They said, what do you want? And I didn't know what to order. I'm a kid. And they brought me stupid stuff like slow gin and orange-flavored vodka and, you know, like lollipop-flavored, you know. Anyway, during the week, we didn't have them guys to buy that stuff, so we would walk down the alleys behind these retail stores, and the first thing we would look for is a quart or a fifth size bottle that somebody had discarded. We'd spin the cap off of it, throw it away, and we'd pick up other bottles, half pints, pints, and we weren't discriminating it. Port wine, bourbon, gin, bot didn't matter. We'd pour what was left and then bottles into that big one. Sounds good, doesn't it? Oh, boy. You know, you run into these people say, I love a good single malt scotch. Hell, I'm good with a good box of wine. You know what I'm saying? But we'd pour it till we got about that much up in that bottle, and then we'd flip a coin to see who got to drink it. And we'd do that Monday through Friday. I love what alcohol does for me. I love what alcohol does for me. Well, I get a little older. And I'm working for a radio station in Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Florida, rock and roll station. And they had an account called The Other Place. I love The Other Place. It was a gutted grocery store, about three times the size of the Shearway down here. And on the weekends, they had all these known bands that would come in, Molly Hatchet, 38 Special, and these cats. But during the week, There was no business. This place was bigger than this gym. And they needed to generate some revenue. And on Wednesday nights, they had this event called Sink or Swim. Hot dog, man. That's just my kind of event. You give them $15, 
They put a rubber stamp on your hand. And you go in and drink all you can hold all night long. Well, I'm an alcoholic. I'm stopping on the way and picking up a pint just to get ready to go drink all I can drink. This is an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and um, we're going to stick to that singleness of purpose deal, except for that monkey smoking that pot. Just let it suffice to say, in the era I came up in, there was a whole bunch of stuff out there. And my favorite thing that they had back then was, what do you got? You know, I did it all. There's some things out there now that I've never tried. I've never tried a Zima. Look at them faces. It must have been horrible. Mike's hard lemonade. What was that thing you like to drink at? Jägermeister. Don't know what that is. But I heard that was a trip, man. But anyway, I'm a child of the 60s. And you, you, some of y'all came up in my, in my time. And y'all can fill in the blanks with that deal. You know, I, I loved it all. Um, I, I loved it all. And... I got married young because I, I grew up in this little Baptist household and we was always in the church and I, I hated going to church because the, pre, the church was right across the street from where I lived. And Mama made me play with the preacher's kids. I couldn't get away from it. So I got married so I could get away from that. Go and drink and use and do violence. I did a lot of violence in my young days. So I got out. Well... There's a word that they that they use in our book, and the word is grace. And I invite you to consider the meaning of that word. It's undeserved favor, unmerited mercy. And I will tell you, thank God I didn't get what I deserved. Thank God I didn't get what I deserved. There's a guy by the name of Jimmy, and Jimmy owned a biker bar over in the west side of Jacksonville. It was called Fling Nasty Saloon. I loved Fling Nasties. Fling Nasties would probably fit. It was little. <laughs> and the side of it was painted in all these psychedelic colors, these swirls. It looked like, looked like Walt Disney had puked on the side of it. And the bikers liked to go there. It was basically a beer bar, but the hippies liked to hang out there too. Because, see, the hippies had the stuff that the bikers wanted, but the bikers didn't want to pay for it, and they'd beat the hippies up and take their stuff. It was a very violent environment. Well, I'm in there one night, and I am tore up from the floor up. Let me just set the... Gene talked about that squishy carpet at the at the bar where he worked. Well, this place had a concrete floor. It wasn't that high class. And they had that one pool table down at the end. There had been so much beer spilled on that pool table that when you went over to shoot a game of eight ball and you drew back to break, that cue ball would roll about that far and just lock up. I mean, it was a sticky pool table. So I'm in there one night. And I am tore up from the floor up, and this guy walked up to me. I've never seen him before. I hadn't seen him since that night. We're sitting there talking about the weather and your mama and them. And he says, do you like to fly? I said, as a matter of fact, I do. There's a right here about this part of the story. You need to realize that there's a cowboy that lives in here. You can't see him, but he's got a loud voice. And that cowboy don't want other men, other people, pretty girls, don't want to let them see you blink. Heard that term cowboy up? Guy says, do you like to fly? I said, oh, yeah, all about it. He said, well, I got a little old plane out here at Hurlong Field. Let's go for a ride. And I said, hot dog, I'm in. Well, it's a cold November night. I'm drunk. He's drunk. I don't know this guy. And about halfway to the airport, I had that alcoholic moment of clarity. I said, Larry, you don't even know if this guy's got a damn driver's license, much less a pilot's ticket. And the cowboy said, shut up, we're going for a ride. 
We get out there, and this is not a municipal airport. There's nobody there. There's nobody in the tower. I don't even know if there was a damn tower. There was nobody there. It was a grass runway, and off in the distance was this little old trailer house. I ain't talking about one of these up on the sticks. I'm talking about like a construction trailer. He says, it's cold. I'm going to leave the truck running. I'll be back in a minute. And I said, okay. And the cowboy is going, don't you tell him. Because I'm wanting out. I'm sobering up. You know, Bill talks about fear sobered me for a bit. I was getting there. Well, he went off in that little trailer house. The light come on and he came out and he waved and I waved. He jumped on an airplane. Light came on and nothing else happened. He got out and he looked over at me and I thought, okay, he got the wrong set of keys. He went back in the trailer house. He came back out and he waved and I waved and he jumped in another airplane. Light came on and nothing else happened. I'm a pretty quick study. We're stealing a damn airplane and I don't know this guy. It wasn't funny at the time. You couldn't have pounded a straight pin in my butt with a sledgehammer. I was scared. Well, he went back in. He came back out. He waved and I waved and he jumped in a third airplane. The light came on. About that time, it belts a little smoke and coughed a little bit. And he waved. And that last ditch effort, me and that cowboy, man, we're doing battle. I said, man, I got to say, just say no. And the cowboy says, don't you dare. We're going for a ride. So we went over and got in that plane and he put that headset on me. And he says, where do you want to go? I said, dude, you're driving. He said, well, let's buzz the bar. Okay, I don't know what that means. Well, he gets that bar on the headset. And he says, we're coming. Well, as the crow flies... It was less than five minutes, and we never got any altitude, but as we got closer to that bar, and guys, keep in mind, Fling Nasties is not in a rural setting. It's in a very commercial setting. There's telephone poles, shopping centers, people's houses. So we're flying along. About that time, he banks that baby over like this, and I'm looking out his window, and here comes the bar. And there's all them hippies and bikers in the parking lot. And we got down right over them phone wires. And and I went, I need to clean my britches out. But I went, that's that went all right. I'm too scared to talk to him because I'm talking about powerlessness. I got none. He's drunk. I'm not drunk enough to tolerate this, but I'm drunk enough not to say nothing. So he never gained much altitude, and he continued to fly east. And all of a sudden, there's this river there called the, called the Ortega River. And much like Louisiana, the waterways in that town are governed by the tides. Kenny, I didn't look at the damn tides that morning. I, hadn't, I wasn't going fishing. I was going drinking. Well, he got down over the top of the Ortega River... You could look out and damn near see the brim bed, and he was that low to the, to the to the water. Well, I'm looking, and we're flying right over the water, and I look ahead, and here's this cotton-picking bridge. It's the Timaquana Bridge. And it don't have a square opening like most modern bridges. It's one of them old bridges. It's got that half-moon shape. I didn't check the tide. Did I mention that? Well, we're flying along. I'm a pretty quick study. I look at these wings. And I look at the opening on that bridge and I thought, man, we're going to need some Vaseline to get through that sucker. (laughs) And I was, you ever been too scared to close your eyes? (laughs) I wanted to, man, I wanted to close my eyes. I told this story up in Canada this past year and somebody said, did y'all crash? (laughs) Really, seriously? I'm an idiot, and I'm a pig. You know, I've never had one of nothing. 
I, I overshoot the mark every time. And there's been so many times that I've needed a hospital. I was over to a guy's house one day, and I overshot the mark on something, and y'all can fill in the blanks. And I'm going down. I'm going down. I'm see that white light, you know, and you've never heard me tell this. He grabbed me before I hit the floor and he drug me to the front room of his house. This is a very healthy, virile young man. This is in the 70s. And to this day, I can't tell you why, but he had a scuba tank that was full of oxygen, not air. And instead of having a mouthpiece, he had a mask. God's grace. See? And today I look back and I go, wow. Because I've... You know, Gene, Gene, <laughs> Gene talked about the gates of insanity of death and death last night. And he says, do I have any gate, G-A-T-E, people in here? And nobody raised their hand. Y'all thought he said gay people. <laughs> and somebody walked up to him last night and said, you know, people are talking. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just Gene's going, no, man, I'm a, I'm a flaming heterosexual. But anyway... <laughs> You know, I, I, I can't, God, God didn't, He wasn't ready for me. And I had that grace, and there's been so many of those things, you know. And, and it wasn't at my own hand all the time. I, 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 I should have been taken out by, by them people that I ran with and in places that I, that I hung out. And, and y'all know what I'm talking about, like Grand Dial after dark, you know what I'm saying? Woo! Well, this radio career, Jacksonville, Florida, in the era that I was there, there were a lot of music that came out of that area, from Macon to, to Daytona. You had the Allman Brothers Band. You had 38 Special. You had Molly Hatchet, Grinders Switch. And then you had them bad boys called Leonard Skinnerd. They'd come by the radio station on a regular basis. This is going to be tough, I can tell you. Come by the radio station on a regular basis to do interviews and, 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 and new album rollouts. And people would stop by for an autograph signing or whatever the case may be. And working in radio was getting old. It had served its purpose. The glamour and the glitz of being on the road with a rock and roll circus was very, very inviting. There's a nighttime disc jockey there that had become my roommate, and he had left the radio station to go to work for a company out of New York City called Sur Productions. Sur Productions is one of the most renowned music management companies in the world. You ever see the movie The Rose? Y'all remember that with Bette Midler? That's the man. The guy's name was Rudge. The man that owned Sur Productions was Peter Rudge. He managed a couple of little bands called the Rolling Stones, The Who, 38 Special, Tanya Tucker, The Dingoes, and Leonard Skinner. Mid-1970s, Peter Rudge was grooming Leonard Skinner to roll into the place of this getting old. Little did we know that they were going to play until they were 150 years old, the Rolling Stones. And he was going to slide Skinner in there, and he started putting them into... into uh, European tours, worldwide tours, and and as we all know, they uh, they rolled out an incredible album in 1977 called Street Survivors. And if you've never given it the chance, if you've just been there rocking and bobbing your head, stop for a minute and listen to the words of that song. That's about getting sober. Just before we left, Gene came to pick me up to fly over here, and I showed him a People magazine that I have, and it showed a picture of Ronnie Van Zant in his home gym. Showed him holding that little baby girl that had just been born with his wife in that collector car. He was living the life, and he was he was turning his life around. He could see the success coming. Well. 
I ended up going to work for Sir Productions. And this story, I'm telling you, please don't think I'm trying to impress you because this story and a dollar and a half will get you a Coca-Cola down the street. It's just a job. But it was a job in my mind that had a lot of glamour attached to it. I mean, Jesus Christ, my name's Larry Scott. I work for Leonard Skinner Band. Leon Wilkinson, the bass player, was my roommate. I lived in his house out in uh, off Landing Boulevard. I mean, so, sorry, Roosevelt Highway. But the road had gotten so crazy. Everything you've read, everything you've heard, all the movies and documentaries you've seen, multiply it by 10, 20, and you got a more ac- uh, accurate depiction of what was really going on out there. We were in New York City. We played three nights at the Beacon Theater with the Outlaws and 38 Special. Ronnie Van Zant was so, he, he was in such a blither, he slammed a steel hotel door room on Gary Rosington's fret fingers and broke them. These three. On the first night. No reason. We did 59 dates in 61 days. We call that one the torture tour. And I'm painting a picture here because it was complete and total insanity. There was so much violence. Ronnie, you could be walking down an alleyway going up like an outdoor venue, like coming, like say they were going to play this gym and you come down that corridor and there's bodyguards or, you know, security there. Ronnie would be flanked and he'd come out of flank and he'd just sucker punch somebody. You ever hear him sing that, sing them songs about the creeper? That's what that is. He'd creep you. And you never knew when it was going to be your number. The road had gotten so insane. The violence was so crazy, and and I, I just couldn't do it anymore. So when we came off of one of these bad tours, I gave a call to MCA Records, and I talked to a guy over there, and I said, Buddy, I can't do this road no more. I love this life. I love the glamour of it, but I can't, I can't be with this band no more. I mean, even when we were home, I'm living with Leon, and he was the biggest nut job in the whole band. Came home one day, and in his own home, he put a damn knife in my waterbed and flooded his own house. That's how crazy he was. It's October 1977. They're doing a worldwide tour of the album release, Street Survivors. We've done a show over in Greenville, South Carolina. Fellow showed up from MCA Records out of Miami to meet with me to make the transition from the band and that management team to doing some front work for MCA Records that would separate me from that band. Well, as always, I'm hung over because I drink. I drink large quantities and do all that other stuff. And, you know, it didn't I get short fuse. And something ensued in that, in that little interview in the parking lot of an autograph signing party. And I basically told him what he could do with his job. I called a friend in Jacksonville and he came and got me. We got back to Jacksonville that evening and newsflash was that the free bird had fallen into the swamps of Macomb, Mississippi. I couldn't believe it. Seconds and inches. As the calendar rolled on and the clock ticked by, years would pass. And I would say to you, what a coincidence I didn't get on that plane. What a lucky break. What I know today, that is God's grace. He didn't want me on that plane. It wasn't my day to die. I lost a lot of friends that day. The story that I was told by Leon when he got back home with two broken arms, a broken jaw, and his, 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 his all, his busted up ribs and had a broken leg. He told me that story through a broken, hard, shut jaw like that of the horror. It sounded like men beating on the fuselage of the plane as it dropped down into the swamps of Macomb, Mississippi because of a pilot error. They dumped all the fuel, it ran out of gas, and it crashed. And that's how I heard the news firsthand. 
If you've never talked to an airplane crash survivor, the horror that's in their eyes is inexplicable. Before that, I had lived with Bob Burns, the original drummer for Skinner. And I'll tell you this because it's kind of a point of information. Bob flipped out. Bob lost his mind. He just short wired over in England. And uh, they shipped him back. And I was hiding him out in Jacksonville from his daddy because his daddy was hunting for him. He wanted to intervene on him. And I said, that ain't going to happen. So I was hiding him out. I came home one day and Bob was gone. <laughs> daddy had found him and shipped him off to a treatment center in Atlanta, Georgia. And about three years ago, I hadn't seen Bob, 29 years, and I'm, I'm speaking from a podium in Atlanta, west of Atlanta, and this guy comes up to me and says, good talk, Bob Burns. Keep in mind, this guy's nuts. Not in a bad way, he just, you know, the wires don't connect. And I said, Bob, Larry Scott. Yep. I said, we live together in Jacksonville. Yep. I said, Caroline, your wife, I dated her buddy Kathy yeah got, he got a clue and I said we lived on Murray Drive he says oh yeah Murray Drive a few years back I don't know the year Brent would remember and Diana would remember I met Diana at the fourth dimension conference in McComb Mississippi I got a call from a dear friend of ours named James Morell that does what she does he said, we'd like for you to come down and share at the Fourth Dimension Conference in Macomb, Mississippi. And I said, James, I can't, I can't give you an answer to that. Because, see, I never got closure on the death of those people. They still lived in my life. They were with me everywhere I went. They were still partially my identity. Never got closure. I never saw any bodies. So I called the men that I love and trust, one of being Charlie Yao. I called several other sponsors and that, and... Charlie always had the voice of reason, and Charlie, my name was Larry Boy. Charlie said, Larry Boy, you need to go on down to Macomb. He says, you know, need to go out to that swamp. He says, maybe you can get you some closure. So I called James back, and I said, I'm going. Sitting on the front row on Friday night, my friend Diane, I've never seen her before in my life. Diana takes the podium, and I'm sitting right there, and I'm looking up at her. I come from Cherokee Nation, and I'm real nervous about going to that swamp tomorrow. I'm real nervous. Diana opened up a first edition book that had been given to her by a legacy named Don Pritz. She opened that book, and when she did, a red-tailed hawk feather just slid out the end of it. And I went, oh. I mean, not mean a damn thing to y'all. But that was my world, and I went, it's all going to be okay. Diana don't know me from Adam. The next morning, I got up to go with Jimmy Johnson, believe it or not, Johnny Johnson. He was my host. He was going to drive me to the swamp along with my buddy Theron Smith. And I saw Diana in the hallway. She doesn't know me from Adam. She just knows I'm on the panel. And I went over to her and I said, I heard your story last night and I know you're connected to a power greater than you and I sure would love it if you'd hold me up in your prayers. And she said, you got it. She had a purse. You could have hit a good size Volkswagen in. <laughs> she did. If she wasn't on that motorcycle night, she'd have it. And if you don't, if you, if, she, if it ain't in that purse, you don't need it. So she goes rummaging through that purse and she comes out with this feather. It's this long, and it's a pointed feather, and at the base of it, it's got some more little feathers tethered to it, tethered to the comb. And she says, I don't know why I brought this, but I want you to have it. Call it hocus pocus. I grabbed that feather, and I looked at her, and all of a sudden, all was right in Larry Scott's world. We got to the crash site. Johnny says, you going to go down to, you gonna, because it's a swamp down there. Says, you going to go down there? I said, nah, I'm good. I can see that tree line. I know where it went down. We drove away from that swamp, and Larry Scott got free.
And people don't live in my head and they don't live in my bed. They don't live in my life anymore. I go visit Johnny and, and, and Steve and Cassie's grave from time to time when I'm down in Jacksonville. But none of them people ain't there. I just read an article in a motorcycle magazine. A guy did some uh, touring around the flatlands of Florida, eating at different great restaurants, mostly barbecue joints, because if you ride motorcycles, that's what you do. You hunt one barbecue joint and then go hunt another. And he found this place down there, and he ran it and raved about it. It's called Neon Leon's. Leon Wilkinson's. Leon's gone now, but he left a little legacy of great barbecue, and I love that. I'm a two-fisted drinker. I've got three bottles up here, and I can't find nothing to drink out of. Well, that's October of 1977. We're going to get down to the nitty-gritty of this, because you all know how to drink. And, you know, you've been scared, but... nineteen eighty the music business had not served me well because i'm not I'm not employable I'd done a bunch of stuff after the crash and I just couldn't not drink and I couldn't not use and so I become homeless and I escaped to Atlanta Georgia I'm living on my brother's couch he had moved up there to start a little business and by the time I left Jacksonville to get to Atlanta my my disease was in full blossom. Somebody said it last night. It might have been Gene. I interview good. I've had the greatest jobs in, in moto journalism and, and rock and roll, all those great jobs. I just can't hold the job. I can get them, but I can't hold them. So um, I'd gone to work for a little record company in, in uh, Atlanta that we'd done some things for, and they said, you know, you can't come around here like that no more. We appreciate you being here, but you got to go. So... This girl that I had lived with on and off for the last 10 years, we were living together, and she came home from work one day. And you remember that part in Bill's story? He says, I was 40 pounds underweight. I could eat little or nothing when drinking. Bill was dying. I was 40 pounds underweight, and I couldn't eat at all because of all that other stuff I was doing. I was dying. And she came home from work on a September of 1987, and she said, Larry, you're dying, and you can't do that here. You've got to go. Well, you know what I did. Violence is my tool, man. I didn't touch her. I don't lay hands on women. But I sure did tell her all about my backside. Larry Scott's homeless again. And when I tell you I'm homeless, talking to Alan last night, I, had, I, didn't, I didn't even have one. I had nobody to call. I'd burn all them bridges. Everywhere I went, man, and you look at my review mirror, that's smoke. I'm living in in abandoned cars and in the bush, under bridges. And occasionally, occasionally, a friend of a friend, an acquaintance, would allow me to come and sleep on a day bed or a a, a couch. And they would make it very clear to me. They said, in the morning when we go to work, you've got to go. You can't be here. And don't do anything stupid in front of our children. Make no mistake, you're not our friend. We're just trying to be loving to one of God's kids. It's October 1987. I'm in an acquaintance house of an, another acquaintance, and she's got two teenage kids. When I got out of bed that morning, I had quit doing all that other funny stuff, and I was still drinking like a fish, but I was detoxing from that other thing, see? I didn't know what I was doing. I really thought I was dying of AIDS. And when I got out of bed that morning, you could slap that bed and the water would splatter. It sounds like a a podium story, but it's a fact. On my mother's grave, I was detoxing hard, man. It's a miracle I didn't die. And that morning, I'm scared because I know I got AIDS. Because that's a symptom, man. Bad sweating. Night sweats. That's what my brother told me. Well, her phone rang. I don't know this woman. To this day, I can't tell you her last name. Her phone rang, and it was my older brother. I don't know how he found me. I'm dying, but you see, that cowboy's still healthy. He still lives in here. She said, Larry, it's for you. 
And I'm thinking, who the hell would be calling me here? It's a daybed. Remember that thing we talked about, God's grace? Y'all remember that? I said, hello? He says, hey, buddy. It's your brother. I said, hey, bub. I put on that face. See, that cowboy came out. Hey, buddy. He says, dude, I understand you're in really bad shape. And if you don't get some help, you're going to die. Cowboy says, no, man, I got this. I didn't know it, but he had found you. This was my running buddy. He had the money, and I had all the contacts, and we'd run for weeks on end, end up in places with people that, you know, you know the deal. He kept talking. He kept talking. He kept talking. And my brother's voice to me was just like that of Abby Thatcher when he went and saw his buddy Bill. His message had depth and weight. He says, I know you can't get to a treatment center, but write this number down. It's a helpline. I said, I can't afford none. He said, write the number down. I don't know nothing about treatment. They have this stupid commercial on TV in Atlanta that says it's a hospital called Charter Peachford. And they always end it with, if you don't get help at Peachford, get help somewhere. And I'm wanting to throw a rock through the damn television. That's not available to me. But he wrote, he, I wrote that number down and I called it. And you answered. And you said, show up over here at this church tonight. And I did. What seemed at first a flimsy read turned out to be the loving and powerful hand of God, see, because I showed up at that meeting. And you told me if you do these things, you can finally get a life. Because, see, I didn't have a life to put back together. Well, I left that meeting and got brooked somebody into taking me to the liquor store. I had a few dollars in my pocket and I bought two bottles of champagne to pay to, to celebrate that white chip I just picked up. Well, it made sense. That's a lamb long, humiliating walk from the back to the front. And I continued to drink for the next 90 days, see. I'd go to your stupid meetings and I'd listen to your stuff and, you know, alcohol wasn't my problem. Newcomer boys over in them yellow shirts, listen up. You see, I thought I was a hip, slick, and cool dope fiend. I was living under bridges and in boxes, but I wasn't a lowly alcoholic, see. But I invite you to walk with me back here for a minute. What was my first drug back when I was six years old? Alcohol. It's December, 9, December 31st, 1987. My last drug was alcohol. All them other things were fortifiers. But I, I had to get here and sit still and let that fog clear before I realized that I'm an alcoholic. If I can't get there quick enough, I can pop one of these and it'll keep me the rest of the way. And if I get too far out there and I can't get my damn mouth open, suck a little gin through my teeth and I can ease back in that zone. But see, alcohol is my best friend. Always has been, always will be. If it wasn't for alcohol, I wouldn't be here. December 31st, 1987. I got up early that morning. I was drinking. I was on another one of them day beds. I drank all day long. I was drinking at cheap, cheap gin, probably something like Gilby's or whatever. And what I'm going to share with you is pretty much hearsay because, see, it eased on into the night. And that, and in, in Atlanta, Georgia, I imagine y'all do it here. You cook them collard greens and them black-eyed peas for that New Year's Day lunch. And this woman that was that owned the home, she was over there cooking. She was at the sink cutting up collard greens. She had a big old four-gallon stock pot of, of greens cooking on the stove with that little pot of black-eyed peas. And in a drunken stupor, I went and picked up that four-gallon pot of rolling boiling water and I dumped it all over that woman's arms. I took that belt buckle, that big old western belt off of that great big old belt buckle, I wrapped it around my hand, and I went through her house in a rage and I destroyed her stuff. This is a day bed. Thank you so much for letting me stay here. I really appreciate the shelter and the food and the bed. January 1st, 1988. Our book talks about the horror of the remorse of the next morning. It's tangible. I didn't qualify to pick up one of your white chips. I'd burn yet one more bridge. 
Well, I'm homeless again, for those of you at home that are keeping score. I got nowhere to go. Our book talks, they use a couple of words in there, and they're pretty important words. When you're reading Bill's story, he talks about desperation. The desperation of a drowning man. And then he uses the word hopeless. And Mr. Newcomer, if you're in this room tonight, I pray that you have the gift of hopelessness. Because you see, desperation's got some wiggle room to it. If you hold your mouth just right and you say just the right thing, mama or that girlfriend or that wife might let you back in. If you're lucky. And if you sweet talk it just right, that buddy down at the job site might let you come back on the job site. If you're lucky. And if you go back over to that attorney and play your card just right, he might get you one more no low and you ain't got to go down for that DUI. That's desperate. But if you've got the gift of hopelessness, there ain't no door number two. This is the last stop on the block. Hopeless means you're going to die deader than fried chicken. And boy, I guarantee you, I got an attorney down in Atlanta I sponsor named David. And David says, I got me a new one today. I said, yeah, you do? He says, yeah, I got him right where I want him. I said, where's that, David? He says, all hemmed up. Boy, when you're all hemmed up, you <laughs> get that head doing this quick. So I get here and I'm hopeless and I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and I, I'm not in that position where just don't drink and go to meetings will, is going to work for me. Meeting makers make it. That ain't going to work for me. I need a solution. I needed a solution to this thing that was trying to kill me like General Custer needed an airstrike. I needed a message of depth and weight. And these old timers came around. They loved on me. And they, they held on to me. And they said, we're going to get through this. Y'all have never once insulted my intelligence, no matter what it was, because I've been up against it in my life, still am. You've never said, you're going to get through it, Larry. You said, we're going to get through this, because this is a we deal, see. That weird math happens. One and one equals three in here. So I start going over to this A&A meeting where my brother's going. Got them old coots in there, these old timers. And what I discovered during that time is these old timers are a mean bunch of people. They love picking on that newcomer. And uh, you told because at this point, keep in mind, I'm willing to do whatever you told me. And they said, you need to come early and stay late. You need to go early and help these people set up. Make that coffee, put out the ashtray, set up the rag, blah, blah, blah. I'm in, so I'm showing up. And uh, there's an old guy named Bob Knapp. Bob sounded just like an old Baptist preacher. I don't know what he did for a living, still don't. But I'd walk in, my brother-in-law would give me a, a job selling cars over at that Ford store. Horrible job for early recovery. But I was doing, I mean... So I'd walk into the meeting, and I'm over there working in, at that Ford store for a draw against commission. I owe them about $550 because I can't sell nothing. And I'm paying them to work there. That's a concept that I just think is genius. You hire people and get them to pay you to work there. But I'd walk into the meeting, and I am my butt is kicked. I, car, car, used car sales managers are the absolute demon. They're like demon seed. And I'd walk in, and Bob would say, Hey, Larry, boy. I'd say, Hey, Bob. How's it going, buddy? I said, Oh, Bob. Whew. I owe these people just a buttload of money for working there. I can't sell nothing. And them sales managers, they talk down to me like I'm some kind of a second-class citizen. He said, Yeah, buddy. He says, You right on schedule. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. Well, I know damn good and well that old man's got a hearing aid, so I start looking around because he ain't hearing what I'm saying. And he'd go right from that to go, you know, make coffee. And I'm thinking, your solution to not dying is making coffee. 
That's your solution. So, we're sitting in this uh, discussion meeting one night. And all, the average sobriety in that room was 37 years. It meant nothing to me. I didn't know what giants I was sitting around. He got around to me and they said, well, Larry, how's it going? I said, well, I'm starting to apply some of the tools and the gifts that you've given me. I got to the, to the car lot this morning and everything went to hell in a handbasket about 10 o'clock. So I went down to customer lounge and I pulled some paper towel down, put it on the floor, grabbed a hole of that sink, and I just turned it over. And everything's been great ever since. Look at this old cuss over there. uh, His name was Jack Blaylock. And Jack liked to smoke them unfiltered luckies down to a roach. He said, yeah, buddy. He says, that turned it over some good stuff. He says, back when I was in Alabama, I used to write them bad checks. He said, I turned them over to God. He said, God turned them over to the sheriff, and they came and locked my ass up. <laughs> you just can't get anything useful from these people. They're mean. They're mean-spirited. Well, it's Saturday morning. I've got, I don't know, I've got a few 24 hours under my belt. And y'all, y'all keep in mind, I was raised Baptist, and I'm still following the dictates of that punishing God Mama gave me. And you told me, they, whatever you told me to do, I'm in. And they told me I need to pray on my knees morning and night. I said, okay. I don't know how to do that. And it was the weirdest feeling the first time I got down on my knees. But I got out of bed that morning. I rolled out on my knees and I started praying. And the prayers had no meaning. They were like a recorded script. And what I know today is I was giving birth to this little conscience. I knew it was just lip service. So I decided I'd call that old mean sponsor. And he wasn't home. And back in the day, they had these accordion phone lists. You put about 200 names on them. Look at the old timers out there doing this. Y'all remember. Well, I started going down that list, and I finally got this old woman. She was about 130 years old. Her name was Jean Graves. And Jean had that old Atlanta money, and she was southern. And every time you see Jean, she'd say, hey, darling. Everybody was darling. So I called her up, and she goes, Hello? I said, hey, she loved me. This woman loved me. Hello? I said, hey, Jean, it's Larry Scott. Hey, darling. I said, Jean, I got this problem. She says, tell me about it, baby. I said, Jean, I got up this morning and I I started to do my morning prayers. And as I started reciting the prayer, they were empty. They were scripted. They felt like a canned speech. Well, darling, pray about it. (laughs) I'm going to read something to you here if I can find it. That thing, I guarantee you could boil a chicken in it. It's so hot. It's 1992 now, and I had been sponsored for the past year by the biggest damn fool you've ever met in your life. We made the goofiest decisions and did the craziest things. It's a miracle we didn't drink together. This guy's name was Larry Scott, (laughs) and uh, (laughs) yeah, I, I don't suggest it, new people. Get somebody that's got some substance to them that have a God of their own. Anyway, I wandered into this meeting one night, and it was a speaker meeting, and there was this guy sitting over there, and 
you know, most of the meeting looks pretty much like y'all do, all comfortable with your flip-flops and cutoffs and that. But this guy's sitting over there, he had on a coat and a tie, manicured hair, proper glasses, older fella. And he opened his mouth. And what he did when he opened his mouth is these pearls rolled out. And all of a sudden I realized that this is the man you told me that I would find. That man that I could share it all with. I knew it five minutes into his talk. So when it was over with, I called him. His name was Bill Sanders. And Bill is, he's a giant in Alcoholics Anonymous in our state. He's done so much for so many. He does a conference like this twice a year for men. And what Bill gave me, he said, um, he says, we do this men's retreat twice a year. It's called the Atlanta Men's Workshop, more fondly known as The Rock. And we're going to be expecting you to be there. And I said, is that the deal where 400 guys meet in the woods for three days at a 4-H camp? He said, yep, that's it. I said, I don't believe that's going to work out for me. (laughs) See, I love women. (laughs) I look better, sound better. When there's women in the room, he says, well, he says, I suggest you go to that or else find somebody else to sponsor you. And I said, well, Bill, what did you tell me them dates were? So I went to the Atlanta men's workshop. And what happened to Larry Scott is I went and protest. And they have, it's all men. And they had these workshops on you know, relationships and finances and spiritual path and all the, every topic you can imagine. Well, they had this spiritual bonfire going off off in the distance and it was all dark except for this fire. And I'm scared to death. I don't want to be there. And they got these, it's about a 10,000 acre plot of loblolly pines out in the middle of central Georgia. And I got off in the dark and they got behind one of them big loblolly pines and I was looking. Somebody walked by and I'd walk around the side of it. About that time I looked over to the left and there's a guy standing behind another tree just like me. (laughs) And all of a sudden I went, I'll be down. Slid right into home. What happened with that experience, guys? Bill Sanders taught me how to respect women. He told me to take how to take that gender away. They became human beings. They were no longer for me to play with and use. He taught me respect. And through that respect, I could begin to build some integrity, see. I said, Bill, how do I build self-esteem? He said, do esteemable things, Larry. Quit hurting God's kids. It's the greatest gift another man has ever given me. But the thing he really gave me is the gift of men in Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the men in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because once I got used to them, I was okay because I couldn't run that game on them no more. I run with Gene. Gene comes from a pretty hard school of sponsorship. And we are, we are boy dogs, man. And I don't get by with nothing. There was ten years I did nothing but men's meetings, men's retreats all over the country. And one night at a holiday party, a woman walked up to me and she said, I don't know what time I started. We good? We good? Five minutes? Oh, good luck. <laughs> I'm not even wound up yet. Anyway, I mean, I'm just getting started. Anyway, this woman walked up and says, I understand you've been carrying the big book to the to, to these men over at the Mar Men's Center. And I said, yeah, I've been there ten years. Gene talked about it last night. She asked us if we'd bring the message to the women. I said, I don't do co-ed meetings. She said, please. So I contacted the men I trusted and loved. And they said, they deserve this. We showed up at Dunwoody United Methodist Church. We are not a glum lot meeting the very first night, me and my partner at the time, Christian. And we sat down in this row of chairs and we were sitting there shuffling papers, getting ready to do this thing. And I looked up and there were six absolutely poster centerfolds right there. Right there. And I went, I hadn't done co-ed meetings in in 10 years. I put my hand on Chris's knee and I said, dude, we're in trouble. He looked up, he says, we need to go pray. (laughs) Well, what's happened is that meeting has exploded. 
If you come visit our group, we're Thursday night at 8 o'clock. If you want a decent seat, come early, like 6.30 or 7, because then women come and they put them shawls and them purses and they get about the first five rows. And don't come in there and try and hit them because they don't, they don't, they don't realize that. They're there to get fed the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. Our, our group is founded and grounded by the women and they're serious about their recovery. And don't mess with their little biddies because they'll take you out. Just saying, they don't need getting protected by me. When I met Bill Sanders, I, I, I found a pamphlet. It's in your rack. It's called A Member's Eye View of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what it is is a script of a, it's a, it's a transcript of a talk given by a guy named Alan McGinnis some years back. And over around 10 or, page 10 or 11, here's what Alan says. And this describes my relationship with my sponsor. I am personally convinced that the basic search of every human being from the cradle to the grave is to find at least one other human being before whom he can stand completely naked, stripped of all pretense or defense, and trust that other person not to hurt him. Because you see, that person has stripped himself naked too. This lifelong search can begin to end with your very first AA encounter. And I'm going to say this, and this is my opinion. If you don't have that person to guide you in a spiritual path, that you can tell it all to, you may have the wrong person. I've gone to Bill and and Bob and Chris Raymer, my my current sponsor, and I've told them the most despicable things. And they've never judged me. They've never gotten angry at me. They told me what you always tell me. We're going to get through this. In the early 90s, I wandered into a meeting and a guy challenged me. He says, have you ever been taken through the Joe and Charlie style book study? And I said, no. He said, why don't you come over here Wednesday night and get you some? And I did. Three guys gave me and my sponsor family six months of their lives and they took us from the blank page all the way through a vision for you. And they taught us what this book says. And uh, on that Tuesday night when it was over, May God bless you and keep you till then. You know that line? I said, guys, thank you so much for your sacrifice of the last six months for sharing this gift with us. Dante says, dude, that ain't the way this ends. I said, what? He says, you got to carry this message yet to others. Remember that deal with Ebby over at the unit over at the Calvary Mission? He went and saw Bill. And I said, I'll get around to that. That's a Tuesday night. And this is the God of my understanding. That Thursday, I got a call from this other guy that helped teach us named Rob Hayes. And Rob said, Rob used to be with Hatchet, by the way, Molly Hatchet. Rob called and says, I've been carrying this book study over to the Triangle Room, and I can't be there tonight. We're on this page, bottom paragraph. Have a good day. And I went, yeah, but he hung up. I showed up that Thursday night. Nobody died. Nobody went to jail. There wasn't even any blood drawn. From that night to this night, Larry Scott, through the God of his understanding, has carried this message out of this book in front of at least one group, if not three a week, all over the planet Earth. And it's not by my choosing. That's God's deal, man. I may not, I can't have a decent relationship and I can't put, I can't save enough money to rub two pennies together. But I know something about this book. It don't pay real good except I want to live, see. And it's just one of them gifts that, that, that God gave me. What I've discovered being out here with you We had a a little workshop this afternoon, and we get complacent in Alcoholics Anonymous. We're not drinking, and we ain't drugging, and we ain't doing all them crazy things anymore. But Gene said it today. See, back in the back, that 10, 11, 12 were growth steps. There ain't nothing in there about maintenance. We want to grow. And, and, And the gift that we've been given when we stand at podiums like this and sit behind tables carrying the message out of this book, here's the charge, and I'm going to give it to you. Our job, our job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. Okay? 
book. It don't pay real good, except I want to live, see. And it's just one of them gifts that, that, that God gave me. What I've discovered being out here with you, we had a, a little workshop this afternoon, and we get complacent in Alcoholics Anonymous. We're not drinking, and we ain't drugging, and we ain't doing all them crazy things anymore. But Gene said it today, see, back in the back, that 10, 11, 12 are growth steps. There ain't nothing in there about maintenance. We want to grow. And, and, and the gift that we've been given when we stand at podiums like this and sit behind tables carrying the message out of this book, here's the charge, and I'm going to give it to you. Our job, our job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. Okay? I hope that somebody in this room tonight got disturbed about the question of alcoholism. I really do. See, complacency will get me drunk. We got these new cats coming in the door, and I'm not going to pick on you guys in the green church. Y'all may have 50 years. I don't know. But in your meetings, here's what's happening every day on this earth. We got that new person that's coming in just like you were. September 1987, I'm in the parking lot of that church and y'all are inside. I don't know what y'all are doing in there. I don't know what you're going to ask of me. I don't know what A&A is. But I had nowhere else to go. I was full of contempt and full of fear and I wanted to judge you. And them same people, them other Larrys are standing out there and they're going to come in your door. They're coming to your meeting. What are we telling them? We tell them about that bad marriage. How about them stupid little kids that won't get good grades? How about that neighbor's dog that keeps crapping in your yard? Is that what we're telling them? How about that shopping cart that got away down at the Walmart and hit your car? Is that what we're talking about? Maybe your lawnmower wouldn't start yesterday morning. What has that got to do with alcoholism? Page 132 says, We have recovered and been given the power to help others. When that new person walks in that door, it's our job. Fifth tradition, carry this message, not the mess. They can hear those same stupid war stories down at the tropical bar down the street here. We've got one shot at them. And if you let them get out of here, they're going to die. They ain't coming back. They can hear them stupid war stories down at the bar. But that's what we're doing. We're doing it all over the planet. And here's a, here's a, here's a little test that my sponsor gave me. Do it. Come to your meeting early, grab your coffee and go to your chair. You got a chair, everybody's got their chair. Go to your chair and sit there with your coffee and close your eyes. In your meeting today and listen in your meeting to see if the newcomer is in your meeting, if he could hear the solution to alcoholism. Not 10 meetings, not 30 meetings, that night, right then, right there. Try it. That's a challenge. I have a strong suspicion that you're going to get uncomfortable with what's going on in your meeting. Maybe you ain't no, drank no liquor in 25 years. But what about this poor little guy that's scared to death because he thinks he might have to bite the head off of a chicken before the night's over? We don't know what the initiation is to get in this deal. If you're a heavy drinker, and our meetings are full of them, Welcome. Load up on our crappy coffee. Get all you want. And our solution for you is just don't drink. Because if you're a heavy drinker, the worst thing that's going to happen to you is detox. That's the worst thing that's going to happen. But if you're an alcoholic like that cat over on page 21 that once you start you can't quit, we got something for you. But if you're a heavy drinker, please don't sponsor any of our people. Because you got nothing for them. If you don't have the allergy of the body, drink the coffee or the Kool-Aid. <laughs> um, I'm winding it down, Brooke. Quit twiddling your hands over. I brought something I wanted to share with you, and I can't find it. Here it is. Here's what your co-founders said. About A&A. 
Bill Wilson wrote this uh, in a letter in 1966. It's only a couple lines. Though a member sometimes may be helped by such matters by his friends in AA, the primary responsibility for the solutions of all his problems are, are of living and growing. Blah, 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 blah. This is why sobriety, freedom from alcohol, through the teaching and practice of AA's 12 steps, is the sole purpose of the AA group. Not one of them. It's the sole purpose, the practice and teaching. It says if we don't stick to this cardinal principle, we shall, we shall almost certainly collapse. And if we collapse, we can't help anyone. See, the, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is perfect. It don't need adjusting or it just needs you doing. It'll collapse at the hands of the fellowship because you see we're flawed. Just don't drink and go to meetings. Dr. Bob said, it's finally, and this is in Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers on page 227, it's finally expressed and offered the, they, the 12 steps, are simple in language and plain in meaning. They are also workable by any person having a sincere desire to obtain and keep sobriety. The results are the proof. Their simplicity and workability are such that no special interpretation and certainly no reservation have ever been necessary. I don't need to put my spin on it. Somebody asked me out here in the parking lot uh, earlier, they said, what's your favorite part of the book? It's the black part. I like the black part of that book, see? Um, brought so many things to share with y'all. As we travel around the planet, we're finding pockets of enthusiasm, and we found that in Grand Isle. We found it when Charlie picked us up at the airport. There's some people getting sober up here in Louisiana. Y'all getting sober and y'all carrying this message. If you don't believe it, go over and saddle up next to Mr. George or Mr. Keith or Mr. Charlie. But you better be ready to hear the truth because they don't do no molly coddling. In the workshop today, we talked about the two kinds of people that walk into our rooms. There's a players and the fans. Players come in here and they set up them tables and they make that coffee and they put out them brochures and they give them rides and they sponsor them little newcomers and they stand at these podiums and they, they, they cheer these meetings and they buy the books for them that can't afford one. Those of you players, them cats out there that cook today, they ain't going to be drinking no liquor tonight. I promise you, because they're in the middle of this thing. Those of you players. And then you got your little fans that show up. They eat the fish and drink the coffee and steal the books and take the rides. Leave early and come late. And another challenge is, what are you going to be? You going to be a player or a fan? I got to tell you, man, I got a gift that I can't. I, the more I get, the more I give, the more I give, the more I get, and it's a debt I'll never repay. We have a lot of fun in recovery. We're about to take a no booze cruise. A bunch of y'all in this room that heard about it are going. We're going in October, and there's a lot of fun there. Um, But just beneath that, the book says, there's a deadly earnestness. Eleventh step says that I seek through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God as I understand God. So I've become a man on a mission for being a seeker through the eleventh step discipline. Some years back, I was over in... I, 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 I pray with Gene and a group of people every Thursday night at 7.30. It's a really cool thing. I've been doing it for 24 years. I was in Iceland with Chris Raymer and a girl named uh, Samantha. And on Saturday afternoon, I had the honor of doing an 11-step workshop about that discipline. And when it was over, this big guy, bigger than a lot of y'all, y'all got some collard green eating stump busters in here. But this boy was big. He's about 6'6". Six, six. And all them cats in Iceland look like Vikings. And they don't talk English very well. He came up to me. His name was Jan. He says, I am staying in your hotel. Could I come and pray with you in the morning? And I said, yeah, that'd be fine. So at 8 o'clock, he comes and knocks on my door. And he walked in. And I explained to him what we were going to do. And we held hands. 
I began praying, and when I got done, I squeezed his hands to signal him to begin praying. And he started speaking in Iceland. They have their own language. It's good figure Icelandic. But he started talk. He started praying in this broken English. And about ten seconds into it, he got frustrated, and he started jerking me all over the place. And I said, "What?" He says, "I must meet God in my tongue." I don't know Icelandic. Hell, I can't hardly speak English. And he started praying to a God of his understanding in a language that I had no comprehension of. And all of a sudden, I felt the moisture dripping off my beard. I was in the presence of a man that was connected to a power greater than himself in a language that I didn't understand. And right then and there, I realized how big this God is. The fellowship has been with me through incredible diversity, death, divorce, bankruptcy, horrible health issues. But you've always been there. And once again, you've never told me that I was going to be okay. You told me, you said, we're going to be okay with this. We're going to get through it. And you've never broken that promise. When I pray, I get one of four answers. Not five, one of four. The first answer I get is yes, and I love that answer. The second answer I get is no. I can deal with that. That's black and white. And the third answer is the one I hate, and that's not right now. And the fourth answer that I get is I cannot believe you prayed that shit. <laughs> but we all were guilty. Guilty as charged. I, I alluded a few minutes ago that I'm, I come from the Cherokee Nation. And in that tongue, the word for thank you is wadu. And I can't thank Grand Isle and Serenity by the Sea enough for having us down here. You guys are top drawer, man. It's a class act. And in Cherokee, the meaning of this phrase is we're all related. Mitakueo yasin. You're all my brothers and sisters, and I hope I crossed your path down the road here somewhere. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.